So now we're talking about incident response. Um, does anyone want to just have a go at telling us what incident response is? I did kind of. But you, has anyone got another definition that includes more than the words that are in the title? It's the way that you uh, react, like the method you use to react to certain events. Yeah, 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 pretty much. So, yeah, it's what you do to respond to something going wrong. Um, specifically, we're most focus, uh, focused on computer security side of things. So, we've had a security breach. What do we do about it? And how do we go about doing that in a way that is something that we've pre-planned? So it's not just us making it up as we go along, but we've got some plan in place and we do that. <clears throat> so incident response involves uh, you know, detecting that something's happened, responding to it, so actually doing something in response to that, and then deciding, well, let's try and prevent that in the future. So you put some countermeasures in place so, you know, try and stop that same thing from reoccurring and then you go back to trying to detect something happening and it just continues on and on and on. So it's one of those things where security is a process, you know, we, we can't just put something in place and yeah, we security, done, check, move on to be doing something else. Security is something that we're constantly doing and trying to maintain within the organisation. So we need to actively be doing security in order to actually keep your organisation secure. So we need to be monitoring networks and monitoring log files and things like that. So, shit happens, <laughs> sorry. Incidents happen, so stuff stuff happens, right? We need to plan for stuff to go wrong. We can't just assume that everything's gonna be cheery and rosy all the time. And yes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an extra expert at setting up secure systems and don't worry, I've set it up, it's secure. You never have to worry about it again. Security, check. No, it's more like, yeah, I think it's secure now. I've done everything I can think of to make this secure. But in case something goes wrong, we need to continue to monitor the situation and detect uh, attempts at attacking. So car, car analogy, why not? Uh, so everything everything can be solved with a, car anal a good car analogy. So we've got a burning car, right? What do we do about it? Well, we need to have a team that reacts quickly and we need to stay organized and in a calm manner. If you actually, if there was a big fire and everyone just like, you didn't have a fire brigade, you just had a bunch of people with water pails, uh, you know, if you don't know what you're doing and you're not doing things properly, you can actually make things worse by spreading the fire or something like that. You throw the fire, you know, you throw a, some, you know, the wrong thing into a fire, for example, you use the wrong kind of fire extinguisher, so you use a foam on, what is it? If you use a foam fire extinguisher on an electrical, or whichever way around, <laughs> you know, uh oh, better do my fire training again. So there are different types it tells of fire extinguishers. It tells you on the fire extinguisher you don't need to remember. It tells you on the fire, fire extinguisher. Fire extinguishers actually have bits written on them to tell you that, so you should, and on a little label above them, so even if you've forgotten, you can always right. check before just in So case just like take the time, hopefully there's not too much stuff written on there, you need no, to like read like the it's, thing. It's, it's pictures as Is well, little pictograms. Oh, that's good. Pictures are good. So if there's something happening, make sure you're using the right equipment to try and put the fire out because if you use the wrong thing, you can actually end up spreading the fire uh, and, you know, make things worse. So we need to stay, remain calm so that we can actually do a good job of it. So, And that's what, if you actually see, uh, you know, firefighters, they're, they're usually very well trained and they will go about things in a very calm, collected organized manner kind of the same as if you're in, in ER and you see nurses and doctors in um, under stress if they're good at their job they just they just get into this mode where in this problem solving mode there's blood going everywhere but they're not all going ah there's blood but they you know they're trained and they'll actually right in under this situation try this try this try this and you know they're amazing um, you know to watch them work so that's kind of what you need to be under the same thing within any kind of incident that you're responding to. So in a security incident, you can see an attack going on. It doesn't help to start running around and getting like screaming that the, you know, the, the sky is falling. You would then do the steps that you need to do in order to recover from that incident. So each person in the team has a role to fulfill and um, you know, you, the thing that you're doing actually needs to be appropriate to the incident that's happening. 
So a security incident is essentially, it's just defined as an event that compromises the organization's confidentiality, integrity, or availability, or basically just any security related event that needs to be handled. So something's gone wrong, we're doing something about it. Uh, it might be internal to an organization or external. So we might be, you know, you could have an incident response team that actually responds to external clients, but often you'll have within an organization some people responsible for that. So incident response is, is obviously important. It's quite obvious that it's important, um, but depending on the size of the organization, it's gonna have a different amount of preparation for that. Uh, but when things go wrong, we have processes in place, so we've got some way that we use to detect the incident. We've got some formal or semi-formal way to actually assess the incident and react to the incident. And there should be a team or at least someone that's prepared to deal with incidents as they happen. <clears throat> so we need to deal with attacks, either from external attackers or maybe employees within the organization doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. Um, so an incident response team, IRT, um, is the that team of people that do that. There's a whole bunch of other names that are used to mean the same thing. So there's like computer incident response team and computer emergency or something. There's like all of these different acronyms. Basically, they mean the same thing. You've got a team of people that um, are responding to incidents, right? Um, and usually a large organization will have a number of people that are formerly members of that team. Uh, and you might actually have time allocated for them to do that role. So you say your job is to actually be on the incident response team and you deal with incidents as they happen. Um, and that's, you know, that's your job. You are a security um, you know, person, you're in this role and that's what you do as, as part of your job. It's your job requirements. <clears throat> it's not always the case. Um, and the, the, the fact that we can, um, uh, in order to actually make that work within an organization, then people need to be aware that that's what there is there. People need to know that there's an incident response team um, and ways that you could raise awareness within an organization. So if you guys go out into industry and you're working doing this, the sorts of things that you can do just to let people know that you're there is you know just having a website on, on your intranet or whatever so that other employees can actually find information about what it, who you are and what you do you might have meetings that you know to let people know about it maybe just a few posters or you know published information share share your findings with people within the organization after an incident's happened just to let everyone know because then you're just having a public face or not not public but within the organization people know who you are so that when someone something goes wrong you're there and you're relatable and they know who to go to and who it is that's actually dealing with these things because you know you'll find in your life in general if you're approachable then um, you know it, it'll, it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously helpful um, if you're a, working in security and you need to convince someone to be doing things a certain way uh, if they if, if you're a relatable person, then it's a lot easier to convince someone than if you're just the security person that says, no, 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 you can't do that, you must do this instead. Um, so you, you try and be relatable and um, that they can see that actually it's in the, in the organization's best interest. So, um, but also there needs to be a clear level of authority. So when an incident is happening, it should be documented that an incident response team has the authority to blah, 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 blah. So that when you say to someone, to, you know, please turn off your computer, and say, well, oh, no, I need to my computer to do work. Well, you know, there's probably a good reason they're asking you to turn your computer up or disconnect it from a network or whatever. Uh, and there needs to be support from management. So with all these security level things, you need to have management buy-in to make it run smoothly. So as I was saying before, Someone might actually be hired to be a member of the incident response team. So there'll be like a real team of real people. Obviously all the people are real, but you've got a, a real team so that there's like a, actually a manager and a budget and all those sorts of things like in an organization. So yeah, we've got these people, they're working on incident response and this costs this much money. And it's just like part of the thing. Or probably quite likely in a smaller organization, you have virtual teams. So you might have people that are working in other roles. Maybe they're, you know, maybe they're 
doing other security related tasks or maybe they're just software engineer you know just doing programmers or they're other people within the organization and you um, would bring those people together when they're needed after an incident so it just depends on the needs of the organization and whether it makes sense to have people you know whether you need them always to be in that incident response team but if you've got virtual teams it's less formally structured um, you can have people that aren't permanently members of the team and you'll assemble it when you need it. So the advantage of that is that you can build your team based on your current need and um, to based on the budget that might be cheaper because you might not need everyone to be available all the time. But disadvantages is team setup can be slow. You might have team members that are actually, they're too busy with something else that's important to actually get on board and deal with something that could be you know, happening right now. Um, so they have like split different um, responsibilities and um, managers might not actually you know you don't have a manager of the team you've got maybe they've got a separate manager with other um, interests so then the manager might actually be trying to roll out a new feature or you know whatever they're trying to do um, and if you're saying well actually we need to assemble this team then that's just a little bit harder not that it can't happen but it's just just a little bit harder so you need to keep that in mind um, and if you're not always a member of the team, if the team is changing all the time, then it might mean that you need to refresh your memory. So if you're called into the incident response team, what are the procedures again? I don't know, I haven't done this for you know months or however long to look up the procedures again, hopefully, and not just like make it up as you go because um, hopefully it's been planned out so that these things actually have a formal way, formal procedures because the procedures should describe how you actually classify incidents so you know is it cr critical uh, you know is this a critical incident or not triaging so I think you guys probably know what the term means from your forensics studies but can, do you guys know what the what triaging means you will know soon because I know Emlyn will tell you about it preventative medicine or something similar where basically you do in bat battlefield triage is when you do it's when they patch them up to the point where they won't die and then shit them and then try and get them to somewhere that is more close secure. close close triaging is about prioritizing so it, it, it medical triage is yeah cl close so uh, on like battlefield triage would actually would actually be like we've got 15 people injured uh, and actually we're gonna let this guy die because we probably we might not be able to save him but if we do something about this guy we will be able to save him so um, you know or if you know if she's been injured but there's nothing we can do to save her she's been injured and she's um, she's gonna die unless we do something so that that's triage so it's deciding what you're gonna spend time on in temp by prioritizing uh, or this person actually she's got a broken arm going to be fine or do I need to do, well, you know it's more important that we deal with this instead so it's the same thing with incidents if there's a whole bunch of stuff happening at once and you've just got a couple of people doing incident response you need to be able to look at that and decide well actually this is low priority maybe our web server's been hacked but actually um, they haven't got access to the actual database they've just got access to something else or you know, decide that this is not as important as something else that's happening at the same time which is more important so you decide to spend your time on it uh, and the procedures will describe how you handle the incident itself so um, it'll also define what the scope is so what does the incident response team actually handle how and when are people informed about things how is information stored? You know, do we use encryption to actually s save this de these details? Because it might be, you know, it might describe how our systems have been hacked, and if we haven't fixed it yet, that's potentially quite sensitive information in itself. So, you know, are we encrypting the, the information that's stored? We're not just sending emails back and forth that have all these details within the email. We're doing things securely. Um, if we're sending emails, are we using like public key cryptography or something like encrypting our emails so that it's not just all available? Um, and how um, how we handle outside parties? So what um, if we're outsourcing things? What if there's like legal issues? Uh, you know how it, it will specify when and if law enforcement gets involved. 
you know, we don't just leave it up to every member of the incident response team to make that decision for themselves. It'll be documented that, in, you know, that in these situations, blah, 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 and the manager will be responsible for deciding whether, you know, whether it'll be documented that the steps that happen. Um, and you have, you know, a strategy, obviously, uh, which is developed as part of the risk, risk um, management. So you sh it should be methodical uh, and well documented, and which that also helps if you do need to go to court, because, uh, um, you know, obviously, if you can describe what you've done and, and why, then that's going to help a lot if you do end up, like, taking someone to court for an attack or something like that. You know, just make it up as you go along. Um, you know, so in some situations, you will have to. Some smaller organizations probably won't bother creating a particularly good incident response plan. Um, but in a larger organization, you, you'd want to make sure that it's as well documented as, you can, as it can be. So you might have a formal methodology that you use. So the PD SURF, um, which is um, the incident, incident response methodology, which stands for the steps that they take. So there's preparation, detection, containment, eradication, recovery, and follow-up. All of those steps are fairly self-explanatory, but we'll just go through them briefly. <coughs> yeah, well, it's essentially, it's the same kind of thing, right? I mean, that's why the picture that I had at the front of this, the slides is someone fighting fire or something, right? But, but obviously, we're talking about computers. Um, yeah, like a biological attack, like a firefighter, like a um, computer security incident, it's the same kind of thing. It's essentially, we need to have plans in place to actually go through, and yeah, I guess like containment and stuff is like, you know, stopping, stopping Ebola from spreading or stopping, you know, your um, security incident from getting worse is actually, the analogy is not that bad. Uh, I guess that's why we call computer malware viruses and things like that, because it sounds familiar. It's obviously different, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so detection. We've talked about this already. So we've in this module, we've already covered incident response. Uh, sorry, we've already covered um, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, so actually monitoring a network for problems. We've looked at um, log management, so actually watching log files for things that are likely to be security problems. We've looked at integrity management, so actually detecting file changes to files and checking whether or not they're supposed to be changing. Um, and you know, also just generally system administration monitoring and things like that is something that's, that's relevant. So we, we've looked at this already in this module. Um, but yeah, so that's an important first step, detecting that something's happened. Um, and now, at, and then at that stage, obviously, you do something about it. So there might be reports um, that people in the organization send in. So someone might just send, send an email saying, my computer is behaving strangely. And that might just be someone that doesn't understand that they're supposed to be double clicking on something, you know, whatever. Or it might actually be that they've got some malware on the computer and that's why it's behaving a little bit differently than usual. You know, that, that's what the incident response team needs to look into. If you've got, obviously on the triaging side of things, you've got someone computer acting strangely and you've got documented uh, log files that show that currently your system, your database is under attack, you can see SQL injections happening, and then suddenly you can see people are, is, are accessing stuff out of your database. Probably, if you're looking at those two situations, you're going to be caring about your database more than someone's computer acting strangely. You might put that on the back burner. It might be related, it might not be, but that's like part of that whole process where you need to decide what you're spending your time on. So, when you get these incoming reports, the incident response team, there should be someone to actually deal with those reports and you know file them in a ticketing system or however you end up deciding to actually organize your response. Um, you know, maybe you've given an ID put in a ticketing system so you're keeping track of these things. You know, what if we're gonna keep track of incident response events, should if we're if we're just gonna name these events, does it make more sense to use like an, a random ID or should we use dates or descriptions or what do you do you think it matters? Just for the, the way that we name these details in our own databases and communications? Sorry? All of them. So we're going to identify the event by a ID, date, and description. What if we're sending emails back and forth and we're talking about the event? 
the it had a short hand that refers to the long hand of the actual incident report. Yeah, because emails are typically insecure, right? And even if you even if you encrypt the contents, often subject lines are sent in the clear. So if your subject line contains too much information, in fact, that can be bad because if someone managed to get access to that, they might find out that there are currently security problems with your system and things like that. So if you just use some kind of random ID, it's much more secure because you're just keeping information you need to know until you're ready to actually go public with the information if you choose to. So, um, yeah, so you do need to think about those sorts of things. Um, and if it's not an incident, you might just decide straight up, well, actually, you don't know how to use your computer properly. Um, I'll just, you just send an email back to the person and say, we've investigated it and we found blah, 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 we're not considering this a problem. Please talk to the IT member of staff to get your computer fixed or whatever. Um, so someone, if you do decide that something needs to happen, you would assign someone in the incident response team responsibility to do something about it. You would classify the information. So you know, what's, you know, how <coughs> important is it that we keep these things se secret? We would uh, design our response. So we would just, you would do something about it. So you've done triage, you assemble your team, you respond to the person, you tell them what you're gonna do about it and how long they can expect for it to take. You use your ticketing system to manage it. You decide whether or not you're going to get law enforcement involved. Um, and you need to decide that as quickly as possible because if, there are, if you're gonna get the police involved or whatever, you need to handle things a bit differently. Because for a, a business, you might just decide, oh, I'll just turn that server off, pull the hard drive out, do whatever. In order to actually, for the police's sake, you might want to make sure that you're being more careful with evidence and documenting what you're doing a bit more carefully and being careful not to um, accidentally change something. And often, we don't report things to law enforcement. Just briefly, why might we not report because it? There's more hassles to report it and have to do all sorts of information and paperwork and reports yeah. for the police than just handle it internally when yeah. it will be more secure and safe and easily yeah. dealable with. Yeah, so there are, there are a few reasons we might not. That we might be legally required to, it depends on the situation. So then we do everything we can to look at all the evidence to figure out what happened. We then react to it by deciding, um, looking at what the options are and maybe isolating the system, using some firewalls, routing, sandboxing, maybe we disconnect the computer or shut it down. We do what's appropriate to stop the problem from being getting worse and we resolve the problem. So we restore our systems back. We make sure we've got all the data collection that we need to investigate it further, but then we restore all our systems. We look at what went wrong to try and design a solution to stop it from happening in the future. And then at the end, we write reports about it um, so that we document what went wrong, how, what, did, what, did we, what did we put in place to stop that from happening in the future, and um, you know, report that stuff to management so that they continue to buy into the whole situation and the fact that you're a valuable resource and they know what you're doing. So, done. That's the end of this lecture.